Listen to scripture as I read it to you from Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth. This is from the 12th chapter. He writes to them, but also to us. It is necessary to boast. Nothing is to be gained by it. But I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a person who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth, for I refrain from it, so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me, even considering the exceptional character of the revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will bold, boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My grace is all you need, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. Those words framed and written in calligraphy have hung over my desk for the last 38 years. They were written by the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth. I just read to you the fuller chapter. He was reflecting upon his life, upon his ministry, and his relationship to the people of Corinth. Those framed words were given to me by a group of 20 friends who were members of my first church in Columbia, Missouri, where I served as an associate pastor. It was Memorial Day of 1979, a brunch. At that time, my life was in pieces. My ministry as an associate pastor was about to end unhappily because the senior pastor of the church was being removed for cause. And in those days, that meant I had to go. And I liked Columbia a lot, and I liked that church. My personal life was in disaster. It was a humiliating public disaster. I was also deeply in debt, and I doubted my own sense of calling and was about to leave the ministry. And that was the occasion for this gift that I received. My power is made perfect in your weakness. I was weak, broken. And those words of Paul have been my companion in ministry for nearly 40 years. They were a reminder that pastors, and certainly Brent Eelman, cannot do it all. They were a reminder that sometimes when I got a little bit too cocky, a little bit too confident, what I was really doing was attempting to squeeze out the power of God and rely upon my own. And the truth is, I am weak. They were a reminder that the lifeline of ministry is the grace of God. And they were a reminder that we need to acknowledge our weaknesses, our humanity, those proverbial thorns in the, that are lodged in our flesh. Why? So that the grace of God might be manifest in divine power. Paul could not do it himself in Corinth, 
or in Philippi, or any, any place else he went. No. And no pastor can either. We need the love. We need the support of a congregation to fulfill our calling. We need to know our own weaknesses and to rely on our congregation, but also God, to complement and to complete our efforts. And so this morning, I want to juxtapose two very similar words, complement with an I and complement with an E. And I will discuss how they have impacted ministry. Then, if you will forgive me, I wish to briefly reflect on my own ministry and the impact of those two terms. Last, I will conclude by leaving you with a challenge as you begin this new chapter in your common life. Compliment or compliment. Both words sound the same. The only difference between these two words is one letter. And yet these two words have very different meanings. Compliment with an I is used when we offer praise. You know, the teacher will tell the pupil, you did a good job on the test. It's a compliment. And it's often flattering. And if one hears too many compliments, she or he can get a big head. They might lose touch with a realistic assessment of who they are with their true self. I can remember when my father, 40 years ago, 40 more than 40 years ago, gave me the charge at my ordination. He warned me about the effect that flattery and compliments can have upon a pastor. You know, pastors, we do need to hear compliments with an eye. You know, all of us have a need to know that what we do has made a difference in the lives of people. But pastors should always be careful when they're hearing too many compliments. Blind praise, adoration, adulation, and compliments soon become meaningless. And they have all this spiritual nutrition of sugar. It's sweet. We soon crave it. We can't get enough of it. It becomes addictive, but it doesn't do us any good. Compliments, though, are important. We all need to hear the occasional at a boy or at a girl. But they need to be genuine. The second word, complement with an E, I think is a more important word for ministry. We use complement with an E to convey that something is essentially made complete by something else. You know, in cooking, we use spices to complement the flavor of the meat or the vegetables we are preparing. Often we will use the term to describe a relationship. You know, the two of them perfectly complement each other. You know where I'm going, don't you? Congregations need to complement with an E their pastor in this same manner. No pastor can do it all. In the words of Paul, we each and every one of us have a thorn in the flesh. And when a congregation calls a pastor like you have, it is like a marriage. It's an intimate, spiritual relationship. But as that relationship grows and matures, the congregation soon realizes that the pastor has some shortcomings. Yes. And when this occurs, it's a crisis. But it can be a creative one. Now some congregations respond to the humanity of a pastor like sharks in, in the water. You know, there's a little blood in the water and the sharks begin to feast on him or her. Others discover ways to complement, to complete his or her abilities with the gifts and with the abilities that the congregation has. Because God has given each and all of us gifts for the building up of this body. Churches with long, successful, and joyous pastorates, and that's my wish for you, churches that experience that are ones that have learned to complement the gifts of their pastor with their own gifts. Now this is a creative response to realizing that your pastor cannot do it all. Long, healthy, dynamic pastorates 
are characterized by the grace of complementary gifts. I want to make a moment of personal reflection. The compliments with an eye <laughs> and the encouragement, and I spent all last night trying to figure out how to differentiate the two for you. Okay, so just fix it in your head. Right? But anyway, the compliments with an eye and the encouragement from my congregation have been truly important to me. I joke that I quit ministry about once a week. And that's the good weeks. But the truth is, that at least three times during my career, I have dealt with the demons of despair, wondering if I had the gifts, if I had the ability to do this work. Honest truth, folks. I have often confessed that Karen has been to me an amazing source of support. And she doesn't give a lot of compliments either, with an eye. <laughs> do you? <laughs> she has integrity and honesty. But early in my ministry, she did something. She saved a bunch of cards and letters that I received from church members and from others to whom I ministered. They were the notes of thanks for perhaps some counseling, a sermon, a funeral, or a wedding. Those notes that pastors get. You know, when I got them, they were nice and pleasant, and I enjoyed them then. But when I was in doubt and wondering about continuing, those cards and notes which she saved in a box for me, and the compliments that they contained, were gifts of grace. They empowered me to continue, and they affirmed my call. And so I want to tell you, when Paul gets here, Send him those little notes and then talk to his wife. <laughs> now, as important as those compliments were and are, the other compliment with a need has been much more important to my ministry. I can remember Jim, an extremely successful executive in my church in New York, probably the most successful person I knew. I was messing up appointments, I was forgetting commitments, and I was not meeting deadlines. He took me under his wing, and he bought me my first daytimer planning calendar. Daytimer planning calendar. And he showed me how to bring organization in my life, and he worked with me. He offered me a compliment with an E. It was the staff of my last congregation that discovered that I often invert numbers. I've been doing this since I was five and could write them. You know, I, somehow I managed to get through school and even do well in mathematics, but always with inverting numbers and going back and fixing them. But I especially did this on dates and calendars. I compensated for it for a long time, but it made planning meetings where we looked at calendars very difficult for me, stressful, truthfully. Well, two of the members of my staff noticed it. I didn't say anything, they noticed it and offered to do that as part of their work as a team, a ministry team we were part of. They complemented my weakness. They completed what was hard for me to do. I also tend to be a global thinker, focusing on the big picture of things. I see the forest and not the trees. And that, you know what that means? It means I'm a horrible proofreader. <laughs> Now, my last congregation recognized that, especially after some really embarrassing bulletin mistakes. Okay, I'll give you a hint. It was, has to do with the word bear, B-E-A-R, B-E-A-R, and B-A-R-E. And if you mix them up, it can be very humiliating. <laughs> it was then that you know, they even articulated to me, a few of them, Brent, we need you to work on the big picture. We need you to work on the vision. And you know what? We'll take care of the details. It's not where your strength lies. And I know whatever success I've enjoyed in ministry, much of it is due to the willingness of congregations to complement my weaknesses and shortcomings, those proverbial thorns in the flesh that I carry. Now, I've been working on job descriptions for the last three months, writing and rewriting descriptions for staff members here at Poland Presbyterian Church. 
And it dawns on me that there is also an important position description that I have neglected. Yours. Yours. The membership of Poland Presbyterian Church has a position description. It includes being a complement to your new pastor. Effective and faithful congregations are the ones that learn how to complement and complete the gifts and the skills of the pastor they call. In two weeks, Paul Anderson will stand where I am now. I've met Paul, and I've spent time with him on the phone, and we've also exchanged many emails. He is a gentle man. He has an engaging sense of humor, and perhaps most important of all, he possesses a pastor's heart. Is easy to like. And I am sure that you will offer him many compliments with an eye. It's important that you express your appreciation to him and also to his family. But it is vital that you discover how, as a congregation, you can complement with an E his gifts and skills to fulfill the mission and the ministry that God has called you to do together. And so let me suggest three ways that you can complement his ministry. First, show up. My favorite expression, show up. Second, get to know Paul. And third, adapt. I'll talk a little bit about each one. First, show up. If you show up regularly on Sunday mornings, Paul will be a better preacher. Worship will be livelier. And it's going to be a lot more fun. I guarantee it. You know, we all know, he will know that you care, and that's important. And because he knows you, or you care and that you'll be here, he will give it more effort and more energy. It's as simple as that. It's part of the equation. But don't just show up on Sundays. Show up when volunteers are needed for different tasks. Show up when he says, you know, I need some help. Show up as volunteers, Sunday school teachers, youth leaders, groundskeepers, choir members, bell players, envelope stuffers, chili cookers, meal servers, ushers, and acolytes. Yes, acolytes. Complimenting his work requires you to be present. Show up. Second, in order to complement with an E, Paul, you will need to get to know him. And this takes time. It takes investment. You need to develop a level of trust and intimacy where you discover what energizes him, what tasks he loves in ministry, but also what de-energizes him. And those areas in which he may not be skilled or gifted, remember, no minister can do it all. And when you know those things, you will begin to complement his skills and his gifts with those that you possess as members of this congregation. And so find out where he needs help. And then give him the help he needs. Remember, ministry in the best sense is a partnership. Paul is not your hired hand. You treat him like that, I'll come back and haunt you. <laughs> Third, adapt. Adapt. That's my favorite word lately. Civilizations, cultures, and species become extinct because they are unable to adapt to a changing environment. Churches in our culture are becoming extinct. It's not because the gospel isn't relevant. It's not because people are not hungry for hope and transcendence. Rather, it is because churches are not adapting to a changing world. Ministries fail because churches do not adapt to the skills and abilities and the shortcomings of their new pastor. Paul will not be like any of your previous pastors. He will not be like me. He has a much more delightful accent. Scotland trumps New Jersey anytime. <laughs> so don't expect him to be like me. He brings gifts and talents I don't have, and ones that your previous pastors did not have. Likewise, he doesn't have all the gifts that I or previous pastors had. And so adapt. Adapt to the unique gifts that he brings because God has brought him here in the midst of you. 
And God knows what he has, and God knows what you have. And together, it will work. You will grow to love him. You'll grow to love each other more. And here's the thing. When that happens, as a congregation, you will grow in every way. Session. The session of this church during the last few months has been wrestling with how to configure and reconfigure the staff here to best support Paul and the gifts that he brings. And so I'm going to tell you as clearly as I can, you cannot go back. You cannot go back to the way things were, nor will things remain the same as you move toward the future. This world has changed. The church has changed. Poland as a village and community has changed. Poland Presbyterian Church needs to adapt its ministry, its facility, its structure and infrastructure, its staffing model to these new realities. And so be ready for change. Welcome it. I know that with Paul's leadership and with the session that you have elected, one of the best sessions I have ever worked with, it will be done thoughtfully, prayerfully, graciously, and carefully. Poland Presbyterian Church cannot afford nostalgia for days gone by, nor can it afford not to adapt or change. But you will need to do so with grace. Let me close on a personal note. You have showered me with compliments with an eye during my time here. And you've also begun to discover ways to complement and complete my gifts and skills so that we could work together. And I'm grateful for that. I think some wonderful things have been done in these two years. But ultimately, as I think about things, there is only one human judge. It's, of course, the great judge above us all. But there's only one human judge of the job that I have done. And that will be Paul Anderson. If he's able to begin well, and if he enjoys a happy, healthy ministry, then I have done my job. The goodbyes are not easy. You have allowed me to enter your lodge for a short time. You have entrusted me with baptizing your children, marrying couples, ministering to the sick and homebound, and burying your loved ones. These are sacred moments when you welcome me, a stranger, into your lives. We all knew from the beginning my ministry was short, and it was defined. And now it is completed. You will always be a special place for Karen and for me. And we are grateful for the love that you have shown. You know, part of my decision to retire fully was because I don't think it could get much better than this. Truthfully. And I've always believed that you leave at the top of your game. Not when the umpire calls you out. My admonition and prayer to you is that you show the same love and support to Paul Anderson that you have shown to me. And I know you will. I know you will. Finally, sisters and brothers in Christ, discover the humility to own your own humanity with all its shortcomings as individual disciples, but also as a church, a community of faith. And when you are able to do this, the grace of God will flow through your lives and through this place. And in your weakness, God's power will be made perfect. And that's what it's all about. And this is good news. Amen.